Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's for our adult faith formation. This first part of our conversation, I'd like to talk to you about a recent visit to France and our ongoing interest in learning more about the five priests who died in the yellow fever of 1873 here. Uh, I want to show you a number of things. Uh, we'll have a little audio-visual uh, day this morning. And I'm also hoping to, uh, to speak in such a way that an audience from France will be joining us. I had the opportunity to meet three bishops over there and any number of other individuals who are very, very interested in this topic. And so I hope you enjoy this presentation as well. I would like to begin with something that you've already seen, but when I show something like this to people who have never heard of the five priests, and I show them bookmarks and posters and pictures of stained glass windows and uh, things of that nature, it, it really grabs their attention. They're like, okay, these guys are kind of, they're, they're for real. And so um, just a reminder about our five priests in this little two minute video. Obviously, no matter what language you speak, that, that will kind of grab your attention and, and help you realize, okay, that there's something special and dynamic, energetic about the, uh, my presentation that I'm about to make to you, uh, to the bishops. I, I will say this, it is in God's divine providence that I am the diocesan administrator, because that little, those two little words after my name help open up these doors to be able to meet these bishops. One of them outright said it. He said, I, I might not have even opened up the email had I not seen it was from a diocesan administrator. And he turned out to be the best, the greatest. I mean, they were all wonderful, but th this one really spent a lot of time with us. Uh, bishop Denis Moutel from the Diocese of saint Brieuc. Three of our priests come from that one little part of Brittany. So picture all of France and as I said, you know, go to Paris and take a left, you know. So go all the way to the western coast. You have Normandy. I think everyone can picture Normandy, the beaches of Normandy, D-Day and all. And right below it is Brittany. And that's where our priests are from. So in a 36, 36 hours, I was able to have uh, lunch and dinner with three different priests in three different dioceses and telling the story, and so much so, it, it gained a lot of attention that it made its way into the national television of France. How many of you speak French? Okay, well you're about to hear something in French and watch um, this video. Again, it, it, I, I wanna show you at least the first part of it, because it shows you of their great intrigue, their desire to learn more about their priests, the people who came from their home villages, who at a certain point said, you know, I'm going to leave France and go on mission, most likely never coming back. And I'm gonna show you some things that, that indicate to you what they left in order to come to an area uh, where, yeah, there were no buildings. I mean, they were the ones building uh, the new churches. So, so like any typical national um, 
television broadcast, news report, you're going to see, okay, here are, the, here are the things that are coming up. But first, here we go. These are all the little different towns in Britain. It's actually the second story. Bonsoir, merci de nous rejoindre sur France 3 Bretagne. Voici les titres que nous allons développer ce soir. Colère Good so far? Les agriculteurs okay. qui travaillent en aval de la rivière de Crac dans le Morbihan. Depuis mercredi, la préfecture leur interdit de vendre leurs huîtres. Pollution oblige. Les systèmes d'assainissement sont pointés du doigt. Coup de projecteur aussi yeah. sur une association qui confecte chapeaux, turbans et autres bonnets pour les personnes atteintes d'un cancer. Des accessoires pratiques, mais aussi très réconfortants. Enfin, nous verrons combien le théâtre de Jean-Pierre Barrault est engagé. Le metteur en scène travaille sur la pièce Métisto Rhapsody, bientôt en représentation au TNB. Avant cela, c'est dans une bibliothèque du quartier René de Vigeant qu'elle a été ouverte. Mais débutons par une histoire peu commune, celle d'Américains venus spécialement de Louisiane pour trouver des informations sur des prêtres costaricains. Les trois abbés sont depuis décédés, mais au milieu du 19e siècle, ils étaient partis aux États-Unis pour aider les malades atteints de fièvre jaune. Des prêtres vénérés outre-Atlantique. C'est un reportage signé Gilles Morvan et Jean-Michel Pierre. Après-midi dans les Côtes d'Armor, le maire, les adjoints et les habitants n'ont pas hésité aujourd'hui pour la bonne cause à ressortir Bonjour. leur anglais premier. Il faut dire que le visiteur du jour est américain, c'est un homme d'église, le père Peter Mangoon. Le voilà sur les traces de prêtres bretons originaires des Côtes d'Armor. L'un d'entre eux, c'est François Le Vézouette, un enfant du village. Des prêtres qui, vers 1860, sont partis pour la Louisiane. Là-bas, il y avait très peu de catholiques. Ils étaient en mission, mais ils n'en sont jamais revenus. Chez nous, ils ont construit des églises, notamment. Mais un jour, la fièvre jaune est arrivée. Et là, ils sont restés avec les gens. Ils les ont soignés en sachant qu'ils pouvaient contracter la maladie. Et ils en sont morts. À Shreveport, la fièvre jaune avait terrassé le quart de la population. Sans les prêtres bretons, explique le père Mangoun et ses professeurs d'université qui l'accompagnent, le bilan aurait été plus lourd. Ici, aux archives du diocèse, tous les deux recherchaient des documents sur les itinéraires de leurs héros. Ils sont notamment tombés sur cette lettre du prêtre Biller avant son départ. Vous savez peut-être que Salvador m'a autorisé à aller en Amérique au diocèse de Monseigneur Martin. This is all about the bishop sending the priest. These five priests represent an example. These five priests are an example for us at Shreveport. The models, the people who stay and who give hands when things are going well, during the crisis, while others are staying and helping in crisis instead of leaving. À Shreveport, en Louisiane, des rues, des vitraux de l'église sont déjà dédiés aux prêtres bretons. Avec les documents rassemblés en Bretagne, les Américains espèrent un jour retracer leur histoire dans un livre et leur rendre hommage dans 4 ans pour le 150e anniversaire de la tragédie de la fièvre jaune. Je vous le disais en titre, les ostréiculteurs qui exercent dans la zone There à you go. de Krakow. Yes, we are internationally recognizable. pour cause de pollution. And in fact, uh, yes, the newspapers as well uh, picked it up. And you should have recognized someone in that particular uh, international broadcast. Michael Dixon was one of the ones who was present. And even here, he made his uh, debut in the French uh, uh, newspaper holding up a poster. The poster that is of, um, we took a picture of the five um, stained glass windows that you find in Holy Trinity and made a big poster out of it. And so, so th that's what's happening here. Michael and I are holding it up as I'm explaining it to to journalists from five different uh, outlets um, uh, in this Brittany area and on that national report that you just saw. So th they were extremely, exceedingly excited. This particular place where we went to, and I'm going to show you a video from uh, Brelady is the name of the place. One of the five priests is Francois Levesouet. Now, 
Uh, and, and by the way, that's how they pronounce the name, the Vezouet. The T is at the end, and normally you would think the Vezouet, and that's how we've been pronouncing it. But remember, we're not just in France, we're in Brittany, and in Brittany they had their own language, they had their own pronunciation of things. So we are now learning how to pronounce things in a Breton way. And so Le Vezouet, Francois Le Vezouet. So when I contacted the Bishop of Saint-Brieuc and Triguet, Saint-Brieuc, by the way, is a church in Brittany that got its start in the 5th century. It's been there a while. I've been, I told him that we're waiting for our third bishop, and he's like, yeah, I'm like 150-something. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And that kind of puts things in perspective. But when I first communicated with him, he saw the names of the priests, and he said, my vicar general's name is Francois Le Vezouet. The same name as one of the five priests. So that, that only offered further intrigue to him, and then he found out where our priest was from, Brelady, and then um, uh, come to find out in literally the neighboring village, we're just talking about villages here, uh, his vicar general comes from there. And so he would be like the great, great, great nephew of, Fran uh, of Father of Le Bezoret. Also in Brelady, we found a, a great like great, great, great niece, um, who was just overjoyed, thrilled about this, and uh, and two other great, great, uh, how many other greats nieces, um, the brother of the vicar general Francois de Vezo, uh, the sister, excuse me, of the of the vicar general, she is a sister, a nun. She is the mother prioress of a little place called Mont Saint-Michel. If you've ever heard of Mont Saint-Michel, that's that beautiful uh, kind of village with the, with the church all the way up on the top of it, built so that on high tide it's completely surrounded by water, low tide it's surrounded by mud. Um, and it has quite a history there too. I guess I'm to use oh, no. this. Just, just when you're ready to uh, do, do we the have the Brelody video? video? We have all the videos. Great. What you were talking about is people's pictures. So uh, the Brelody uh, video um, shows shows uh, part of what we just saw in the national um, video, but it also you're going to be greeted by the Bishop of Saint Brieuc. Uh, so have any of you have any of you happened to see this video on Facebook? One, two, three, four. Okay, a little bit more. All right. Um, and, well, let's let the video speak for itself, and then I'll, I'll come back in a Brittany. couple of minutes. This is the tomb of the Levesoe family. You see the third name down, Auguste Levesoe. This is the nephew of our Francois Levesoe. Auguste would have called him. Uncle, Uncle Francois. And so we are here today with Mr. Mayor. He is Mr. the mayor Man. of this town of Brevedi. And I also want you to, to meet the Bishop of saint Brieu and Trigue, Bishop Dennis Mouter. I am very glad. I enjoy very much to greet you uh, people in uh, Louisiana. It's a uh, so big pleasure to welcome your delegation and Father Peter. We are very impressed that uh, the faith and the evangelium to one priest from here came to you at three. Yeah. It's a very big joy. Uh, God bless you all. Thank you so much, Bishop. We, we share this saint. We want to call him a saint, but a very holy priest in common. It's nice that you sent him to Louisiana. We are also very fortunate to Michael meet some of the family family. members, the descendants of the Levesque family. So please come with me. As you can see the church here. The church itself uh, was recently built. And when I say recently, from the 1800s, the end of the 1800s. And all the way back here, something that Father Levesque would have seen would have been the coat of arms here. Very beautiful coat of arms uh, representing Brelady, 
the, the people who first arrived here. So Father Nevesue would have actually looked at this coat of arms itself, not the church. Let's go meet some of the family members of the Nevesue. The, the church was built on top of the old church. We uh, have several think members back, uh, uh, the who are feudal direct system. descendants uh, this was an area of the Nevesue family. I look forward to introducing you to them. Uh, we have a nice delegation, and here with us are family members of the Levesque family. So this is the priest, the vicar general of the diocese here. His name is Hervé Levesque, and some of the great nieces, uh, including Danielle and Annie. It's wonderful to be able to meet some of the family members, and it's nice that they are standing here because they're standing next to the old baptismal font, which no doubt our priest would have been baptized here. Again, this church was built in the 1880s, and he would have been baptized here. This was the, the original baptismal font. It is so nice to meet you here in your home, and we look forward to telling you more and more that we learn about your relative and our very special priest. I would like to take our people inside. Uh, just for Father Peter Brayletti. Okay, I like that. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just just to make sure that you understand, I mean, they, I mean, they're just standing there nice and calm, uh, you know, part of a video. They're, they're over the top excited. They are just so, I mean, this guy, uh, Father Hervé de Bezouet, I mean, he's already been in communication since I've been back, has, uh, I mean, they're, they're doing everything they can to find out more and more about their uh, distant relative. Uh, they, are, they would love nothing more than to have someone from their family declared a servant of God or venerable or blessed or a saint. I mean, imagine someone in your family, my family, and I say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, the, 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 that person we keep talking about, that, that was my great, 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 great nephew, uh, uh, uncle, excuse me. Um, so, and then, w when we went to uh, Mont Saint-Michel and met the sister, his sister, I mean, when we handed her the holy card that had Francois de Bezouet, she was like, <gasps> and just kind of held it to herself, took a look at it again, and then in just a few, uh, you know, like, what, an hour later, not even an hour later, we were up in the main chapel of Mont Saint Michel, and she was uh, in her prayer position there, kind of close to the altar, and had that her books and right on top of it her uh, the, the, the holy card. Um, but we're going to send some more holy cards to them. They want them. They want to start praying through the intercession, and will let us know if there is at, at any type of a miracle that is related to the praying through their intercession. So, any questions about Braility, of what you see so far? Because we're about to walk inside. It's just it's a, so typical French and, um, well, European church where the cemetery is just literally right there. If you've been over there, uh, Germany, everywhere you went over there, uh, you had um, uh, the cemetery right next to it. All right, we'll keep going with the video. To see some other things that Father Levesque would have seen as a little boy. We have some fat, I'm wearing the some same people of the, of, the, of the community of Brevedi here also. Very nice. Uh, actually, let me show you one more thing, because this cross right here is from the 1600s, so the 17th century. It's kind of hard to see with the sun in the background, but. Francois would have looked upon this, no doubt whatsoever. So join me inside as we enter the church. And right there is where the, the, the whole Some television of the items brought took into place. the church obviously predate this particular structure. But this is a, such a beautiful church. Please join me. And all the churches were like that, whether they were reconstructed or... I mean, these are the type the churches our priests left in they order to go here. on mission. They're so excited to have us present. The Blessed Sacrament is here. I wish to show you a few items. So please join me. They would have a special 
banner that they used in the context of a procession. And they would go each year on the feast day of St. Columban. St. Columban was a, a monk who came from Ireland. Not that he came here, but they have a specific devotion to him. This is an image of St. Peter, and this is silk and velvet. It's actually quite heavy, and they carry it in the procession itself. On the other side is a very beautiful image of the crucifixion scene. We can imagine that in the actual procession itself. Also, something else, I, I must admit, I can't help but think that maybe Francois de Vezouet carried it, because it, it takes a strong man, and we know that he himself was a strong man. This is a, an image of St. Columba, Columban with the relics as well. This is a relic. Right? This as well is from the 17th century, the 1600s. This was in the original church, like the banner, and this too was carried in procession in the very, uh, it's a procession in which they asked the Lord for mercy. And one more item to show you. Though the side altar is new, the image of Mary holding the child Jesus is not. It is a beautiful statue, again, that comes from the 17th century, the 1600s. No doubt, at some point, the young Francois de Vezouet knelt and prayed to the intercession of Mary, prayed the Hail Mary, maybe even had a sense of his vocation on this spot where the original church was. And again, uh, another beautiful connection to the past and to one of the five priests who we are celebrating because they brought the gospel message from this area where Catholicism, Christianity first arrived in about the 5th century. So again, it is this kind of mind-boggling for us back in Shreveport. But he left here, he was born in 1833 on August 10th, and in 1854 he left from the Hav because the bishop was looking for some priests. The bishop himself was from Brittany, the first bishop of Natchitoches, as I've mentioned to you before, and Father de Vesoway was one of the first to respond to that call. He was the fifth priest to die, and at no point was Shreveport left without the sacraments because of the courage of these priests. So now I look forward to telling you more about our next priest, Father Jean-Pierre, the first pastor of Shreveport. We're about to go about 50 miles away to a little town of La Loupe, where the church is even older than this one. So join me there. All right. So um, I wanted you to hear that last part again as a reminder of the whole context of these five priests coming to Louisiana. So remember... Uh, the Diocese of New Orleans and Havana. <laughs> All of Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, at least along the coastline. I mean, they weren't states back then. And the panhandle of Florida, which used to be even uh, uh, bigger, um, down to... Uh, well, there wasn't a Miami, but go all the way down and uh, get to... Cuba, Havana, that was one diocese. And by the way, when I say Louisiana, I mean Louisiana Purchase. Okay, so the, the, that was all under uh, one bishop's. Slowly but surely, um, people start moving in. Uh, Christianity, Catholicism goes to these areas. They start dividing them up into dioceses. The, uh, the state of Louisiana, what is currently the state of Louisiana, of course, um, we came to stay April 30th to 1812. Um, and, um, and so shortly after that, uh, it, it was one diocese. It was 1853 that we get our own diocese, northern uh, Louisiana, the Diocese of Natchitoches. Natchitoches was the big town uh, at that time. And the priest who became the founding bishop, the first bishop, was himself from Brittany, 
uh, Father Martin, Auguste Marie Martin. He was from Brittany, and the year after he became, okay, so he was a priest. Oh, all right. All right. <laughs> so he, he comes over from Brittany, goes to Indiana, uh, uh, serves there for a while, goes down the Mississippi River. He serves in New Orleans for a little bit, goes up. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'll go more quickly. Uh, uh, makes his way down to uh, New Orleans, uh, becomes uh, and serves there for a while, and then is sent to St. Joseph's in Baton Rouge, which is now their cathedral, uh, and serves there. And while he is there, that's when he is asked to become the founding bishop of Natchitoches. 1853, 1854, he goes back home, says, hey, priests, um, seminarians, I need some of you to come over. And the, the, let's just imagine what that must be. Like. Sorry. Uh, maybe a new, ba new batteries is probably what. Okay. Um, just imagine what that must have been like when he stood up in front of them without a microphone um, and, and said something to the effect of, hey, I need for you to leave these beautiful churches uh, this area where Catholicism has been since the 5th century, and I want you to come back with me to an area that needs the gospel message proclaimed for the very first time. Uh, we have one church, it's in Natchitoches, nice church, kind of sort of looks like a, a very small village church uh, 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 to what we're accustomed to. And you know, um, I can't promise you a salary. <laughs> I, I can't even promise you really a place to stay. We're going to have to build some new churches. Um, and when you come over, you're going to have to learn a foreign language, English. You're going to have to... Um, uh, there are a lot of difficulties over there in the United States. Um, um, a lot of things are brewing in the South. Um... um uh, about the only thing I can really promise you is that you're going to find some, um, some illnesses that we ne have never dealt with over here in France and that you have no immunity to. Um, most likely you're going to be buried in an unmarked grave. You know, I mean, th th that was probably part of the, the speech. I can't help but imagine it. Uh, I say that because that's related to one of the speeches that another bishop gave. And so... Um, so I can't help but think that something like that would have been a common thing to do. And at that point, three people said, yes, I will go. And this Father Le uh was one of those uh, initial three. He was the fifth to die, but he was one of the, the first uh, to come over in 1854. Uh, one of the things that I am a little, I'm not surprised, but a little disappointed in is that they didn't know about him. They have, even in 150 years, uh, had, had totally forgotten about the fact that one of their family members who had been a priest left and uh, went and died uh, over there. So, um, so what we are finding things in the archives, letters that have been sent back and forth, but they were unaware of him. I mean, how much better it would have been to arrive and there's a stained glass window of him inside the church or, you know, here at this font was baptized, Francois Le Vezouet, who, uh, but, but our visit to the five different places is definitely increasing a, a sense of um, devotion to these people who, had, who were their own. You know, at one point, one of the bishops said, well, you know, it was great that our priests were able to go over there. I said, they're our priests. Yeah. Our, you know, we're, we're in this together. Um, and so we were able, in this particular village, to go not too far away from the church. Um, actually, across from the cemetery was the place where Auguste Le Bezouet, uh was from. He was the one whose name was on the tombstone that I pointed out, the third one down, the, uh, the nephew of Francois Le Bezouet. We have a picture of him and his wife standing uh, at the, the, the threshold of, a, of the door of the house next to the church. And this man is wearing, uh, you should see them, uh, these wooden shoes. 
I mean, it's, it's those big old wooden shoes. Um, um, and then just a little bit further down the, uh, the way was the uh, birth home of Francois de Bezalet. So we were able to go there as well, and Cheryl is like touching everywhere, <laughs> the, 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 the threshold. Um, it is still in the Lebesuet family. So the, the woman, uh, Danielle, uh, who has the, had the long black hair, with whom we ate lunch the day before, um, said, oh, by the way, you know, I, I live in the house where he was born. Would you like to see it? Uh, you know, it's like, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> We'd like to go there. Um, so, the day before, as I just mentioned to you, was the third of the three lunches, dinners that we had in 36 hours with three different bishops and three different dioceses. And what this guy did was he organized a very, very nice luncheon, and we had uh, the, the three mayors of three of the villages were invited, and their... Uh, uh, sure. Um, were, uh, were present, and one of the uh, great, great, great nieces of uh, Father uh, Lebezouet, and we were able to make some of the presentations as well. These are all chronological order. How does it work? There we go. Where, where is uh, what I'm talking about? I'm in Braille with you right now. <laughs> you were talking about the Mavezawets, and that was in um, some second day. So here we go. Francois Mavezawet, <laughs> and there, there's the, the church, the, the stained glass windows, uh, his house, excuse me. Um, and this is uh, the people who are related, the two in the middle who were present at that particular luncheon. Here's the, 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 the crew. Uh, the national television crew, uh, a number of the people right there in the middle, of course, is, um, is the Bishop uh, Mutel. You can see Michael Dixon, who again is sitting all the way in the back there. And when we made the uh, presentation and were on national French television, it was like National Day at Loyola. And it, I th think Celeste is, where is Celeste? I thought she was here. She's gone. She's teaching. Um, um, they're watching the, the broadcast uh, of the French television in the Loyola classroom. And then all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, that's Celeste's boyfriend <laughs> who, is, who is there. And so Michael is, uh, and he was my poster child. Uh, <laughs> And um, so this is the guy who wrote the book, The History of Brelady, and he was giving that to me, and uh, it, was just a, a, it, it was just a wonderful occasion to be with them and to see their excitement, their joy. They rolled out the red carpet everywhere we went. One of the mayors of, uh, okay, so Brelady, by the way, 150 years ago, there were 900 inhabitants, and you saw that church. 900 inhabitants. Of course, every single person was Catholic. Uh, today, there are 300. You know? Most of them were there for the interview. Uh, <laughs> but um, then remember at the end of the video, I, um, I said, um, and now we're about to go uh, to another little tiny village. Uh, and Father Pierre was the founding pastor of Holy Trinity. If you got the Catholic connection, you see a whole story about Father Pierre and how he uh, founded a church in Bayou Pierre and, I mean, literally built the church there. And um, at a certain point, he's like, you know, I don't really think this little community is going to grow that much. There's a community up the Red River that seems to be growing and is probably poised to become like a real city, Shreve's town, you know. And so he, he asks the bishop, the bishop gives permission, he leaves uh, uh, Bayou Pierre and goes up to Shreveport. And he, so when we found 
what we were handed, I mean, we saw the book with the handwritten um, act of birth, a birth record, and with his uh, parents' names and all, all the dates and everything. And his father could not sign. His father was illiterate. Father Levesowet's family, very literate. That, uh, so that they came from not just far, uh, a farming family, but people who owned the land. And so, I mean, back then that would have been, you know, landowners. You know, you're, you're a, a much a different um, class. I probably shouldn't say it like that. You, you got the picture. Um, whereas this guy's dad couldn't even sign his own name, had to get someone else to sign for him. Um, and by the way, it says that in the act of, it says, you know, he can't sign his own name. Um, and so we get here to this church, uh, which is from the 1400s. The 1400s. It's in Lanlu. That, you don't pronounce the last letter. Um, and the, you see that cross in the middle of the cemetery, a, a very custom, a customary thing to see in Brailevi. Um and so this church, he would have been in all five of these guys. They must have led processions, carried the cross or the, or the incense, made their way to the altar, knelt at the altar, did all the priests back and uh, uh, prayers with the priests back and forth with, the, of course, the Latin Mass. Um, and so this particular village is about one kilometer away from the sea, near the English Channel, but it's already, it's not even the English Channel at that point. Near, or it is. It is already, it's still part of the English Channel, going out towards the Atlantic. Um, so very close. In fact, one of the, the town's um, city councilmen was there, and a young man, and he, he spends two and a half months on a boat, and two and a half months back home with his wife and, and uh, soon uh, child. Um, and his next adventure, he was telling me, he said, actually, hey, I'm about to go to Louisiana. I'm going to New Orleans. And I said, are you leaving from La Havre? He said, actually, yes. I said, you're going in the same journey that your uh, predecessor from your village uh, went on. So when you get on there and you enter into the port of New Orleans, and he's only going to be there for like a day is what he said, um, I wanted to arrange that day so I could meet him down there, but I mean, can't do everything. Um, but I, he, he was like, I, everyone in this town, they were just really amazed to hear his story. Because we could talk about him in ways that we couldn't talk about Father Bezoet. We know more about him because he's a founding pastor of that uh, uh, Bayou Pierre, um, uh, the founding pastor of Holy Trinity. He's the one who had no money to build the first church in, in Shreveport, so what did he do? Remember, he tutored a lot of the wealthy uh, Protestant and Jewish families' children. And uh, the, the, there were more Jewish families back then than, than Catholics. You know? Um, and he started slowly but surely raising the money, uh, gathering all the money, of course, when he died, he was penniless because everything he got, he put back into the church or gave away to the poor. So uh, built that first church of ours and, um, uh, and became a very well-respected, known, uh, trusted person in the, in, in the town, even though he was, you know, one of those Catholics. And when it came time for the yellow fever and a lot of the uh, other ministers of other faiths left the city, he stayed. He and, the, and Father Camere stayed uh, in order to be with the people, to, um, to care for them, even though they knew that it most likely would mean they're going to uh, an early death. And so uh, that's exactly uh, what happened. We have a, here's the baptismal font at which he would have been baptized, uh, the one on the left. The one on the right would have probably contained the holy oils and other things related to baptism. Um, in that church, not this church, let me go back to here, um, there were statues of St. Giles and St. Blaise. I have the video from my you want to show that? Sure, let's do a video. Let's listen to me 
in a different way. You're not going to have to see all five of them. <laughs> Go to the home page of St. John Bergman's, We're click on the F for Facebook, and then you can find it. Jean-Pierre. The sun's going down, so I'm doing this really quickly. That he, nor he would have seen, no doubt. <clears throat> Look at this beautiful church. This church is from the 15th century, 1400. This is the church itself that Jean-Pierre would have come into, was baptized in, and would have... Uh, received his first Holy Communion and perhaps even made the, uh, had the, the real feeling of vocation and wanting to, to join the Getting church. Busy. It's a beautiful countryside, this Lambu. I'm showing you all of this right now, even before I've been inside. Why? Because of this, the, the, the sun that we have right now, I want to make sure that you can see the beauty of the church. Look at this. Unbelievably beautiful Doorway, please come with me. The apostles, as you can see here, each one of the apostles, we see Peter clearly. Let's come on in. In fact, you're seeing this for the first time as I am. Well, five seconds after I see it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Look at this. This, this is, look at these old, ancient, uh, statues here. Unbelievable. They, this land has so many saints. I'm learning. There are saints here that I've never even heard of. And they want more. So when I talk to them about Father Jean Pierre being a saint, they're like, yes. We have the sign of altars here. Again, I see a banner over there. One of those. In the uh, procession. Ah. Right over here, I see the baptismal font. And I was told that the baptismal font is original. <coughs> St. John the Baptist, not surprising to see. Very beautiful painting as well. But most importantly, a baptismal font. <coughs> that which he would have been baptized. My goodness. Nice side altar here. And then again, we can go to the high altar. A beautiful bamboo as well, where the, the priest would have preached from. Uh, my goodness. And then, uh, and then right here, the high altar. Well, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment. I will come back in just a moment, and we perhaps will be able to talk a little bit more about this beautiful church that you see here. So, when I say high altar, I don't mean the, the, the altar that what was right there in front. Obviously, uh, before the Vatican Council, that would not have existed. I mean the high altar that, look at that smile. Uh, the high altar that would have been all the way back there. Um, and, and again, uh, I, I, I picture uh, Jean-Pierre going there, kneeling down, uh, knowing all of the prayers, uh, being part of all of the big processions. But I, I stop it here because the, the statue that's on the high altar, that is a statue of St. Giles, and there was also a statue of St. Blaise. You know St. Blaise? The, uh, well, there are 14 priests who are known as, what's their title? The Holy Helpers. Holy Helpers, thank you. The Holy Helpers, 14. 13 of them died in, in plagues. There are Holy Helpers related to the plague. As in Father Jean-Pierre, uh, the, the feast day of St. Giles over there is on September 1st. The plague in the city of Shreveport had already begun. The epidemic, the yellow fever, had already begun. And then there's, uh, it's the feast of St. Giles. I cannot help but imagine as he's praying those prayers, thinking back to a statue that he knelt down before hundreds of times, knowing the story of those two uh, saints who are represented in the church uh, in statues as holy helpers in the time of, 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 of a plague. I mean, I, I just can't help but think that this is, um, um, you know, it's no, it's no coincidence. He would have known their stories. He would have prayed to them. I, he would have called out upon the intercession of St. Giles on September 1st, and he died on September 16th. 15 days later. 
Um, anyways, I want to highlight that to you. Um, anything about Lanlou that you're interested in, or Father Jean Pierre? They still hold the service there. And oh yes, 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 yes. So I, I said at the very end there, right after that smile, <laughs> um, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment, right? Um, uh, well, I never did uh, because when we went out at this moment, Bishop Denny Mutel, who is following us, by the way, to all of these. There are so many churches in his diocese, which is about a third of the size territorially of, of ours. When he went to Brelody, uh, the church before, he had never been there before. I mean, we're driving along, I'm in the passenger seat, and, and you know, all of a sudden we go, very beautiful. If you've been to Brittany, you know what I'm talking about. Very beautiful countryside. Um, and then, then up, oh, there's another church. Yeah, I don't even know what that one. You know. um, and so, so he's coming with us to all of these churches. And so he is actually, when I'm standing at the uh, back, remember I, we just did this very quickly? I, I just said to show, okay, let's start video. Okay, here we are in the mood, you know, um, you know, and I just got to going. Uh, well, he just walked into the church and is now looking at me saying, <laughs> Come on. I'm like, okay, so I'll be right back with you in just a, just a moment. Click. Okay, what do you want, Bishop? You know. Uh, <coughs> and I forgot. He's watching right now. So, okay. okay. Thank you. That was, was a great day. Um, and so, so we go out into the cemetery area where the mayor is there, the assistant mayor, who is even more excited than, than the mayor himself. Uh, the city councilman I told you about, and several other people. At each of these places, by the way, they had a nice little reception. They're known for these uh, particular type cakes, and they, they have so many apples over there. They have apple cider. I had apple cider everywhere I went. Um, not complaining. Um, uh, and so we get to this room, and they make a formal presentation, uh, a, a great joy, gratitude. Uh, that they have for us being there. Then we walk back into the church, and one of the posters that I had given to the mayor the, the day before at that luncheon was already there, flattened, and they were ready to put it onto this uh, uh, bulletin board that was already there, and she's telling us about it, um, and she's just, she's getting emotional. That, you know, one of ours, you know, and I can't wait to tell the congregation on Sunday. So the question was, you know, do, do they still have mass? Well, yeah, I can't wait to tell them. And look, this is one of our guys. And remember, in each one of the panels, they have, like, where they were born. Uh, a lot of it just says France, very generic. But sometimes it's uh, specific with the coat of arms uh, that they have over their head. So, so yeah, um, um, it was just, it, it was great. It was a wonderful, wonderful tour. Um, I mean, I can keep going. What do you want? <laughs> I guess we could go back to the start. I was going to say, do you want to go back to that? Do you want to go back to the beginning and talk about Father's Year Call? Yes. So Tina. they have the, the, each town, they keep these records, you know, from, from the let's, beginning. Let's talk to Jacob. Yes. So, so. When we went to Eric, H-E-R-I-C, with the accent on the first syllable, so I, I kept saying Eric, and they kept saying Eric, you know, so um, uh, I kept saying Gergal, and there's like Jergo. So I'm learning how to, to say their names as best I can, Jergo. This is Louis Jergo. He is the guy who is from... Uh, he was the founding pastor of the church in Monroe, St. Matthew's. And when he arrived, they wanted to kick him out. <coughs> what are you thinking you're doing here, you Catholic papist priest? You know, whatever they would have said back then. Um, was spat at, was... Um, and on his tomb in Monroe, it says that he is from the town of Eric, so we knew that. Um, and that he was the beloved pastor for 17 years, almost 18 years. Uh, beloved, 
Because at a certain point, now they love the man. Uh, kind of like uh, uh, Jean-Pierre. He, he became a very trusted person, uh, a, a town leader. And when, in 1873, the yellow fever breaks out, and he's like, I've got to go. He just got the kind of the emergency call. The first who had already died, the third priest who was at, at the Fairfield Convent, which, by the way, was not in the city of Shreveport. That was way outside the city of Shreveport, you know, three miles away. Um, uh, he comes to the rescue, anoints the, the first two, Father Camere and then uh, Father Pierre, and they die on the 15th and the 16th. Camere, the youngest, going first. Um, uh, and then he stays in the Shreveport area, and, and he knows that... See, remember, he thinks that just by being close to someone who's ill, he's going to breathe in the virus. He doesn't realize the mosquitoes are, are the culprits here. Um, and... But, but so he he has a sense of I'm going into this battle zone. I'm going into this uh, plague-ridden place, and I, I will die. And sure enough, he gets the disease, and and they put out the word to Monroe, hey, come, please help. Uh, and Father Jargo finally says, look, I'm going. I gotta go. I know I go to my death. He tells the people as he's getting on horseback. It's a three-day journey. You know, so. Uh, he's stopping along the way. Most likely, I presume, the last of his stops would have been in Minden because there was a little outpost there in Minden, and he had been to Minden before. So I think he probably, probably stopped there and then made his way in time to anoint Father Belay, and uh, then he stays and, of course, contracts the, the disease. Um, and then calls down to Natchitoches, and that's when the fifth one, Father Lebezouet, Le comes up. So, but Father Jargo. Um, so, so what we did was, literally, we land in, into Paris, all right? So then we, we, we uh, had already arranged transportation. We go to Chartres, all right? I mean, we're on our way to Nantes, and it's like right on the same road. So we want to stop. We get an hour-long tour. It was great, freezing cold, but beautiful uh, weather. Um, and then we make our way to Nantes, and just going in a little more direct north is a town called Ren, R-E-N-N-E-S, um, a, a town, a huge city uh, uh, called Ren. And on the way to Ren is uh, Eric. So we go to Eric and uh, we find, uh, we see the church, we have an appointment with the sacristan who's like 80 something years of age and arranged for us by the Bishop of Nantes. The Bishop, who we would see later, uh, the next day, um, himself intrigued about the whole thing, wants to learn more about this guy. We, we had already been in communication with him and with his archivist, and um, I'll jump ahead a little bit. The archivist gives to the, to the Bishop a little thumb drive, USB, everything, and proudly presents it to Dr. White over there. Um, and at a certain point, he says, do you want to see any of, the, of what I have on there? And we're like, yes. Uh, so we walk upstairs to his office, right next to his living quarters. I mean, it was really neat, because he just puts it in there, and we're all looking over his shoulder. He brings it all up on his computer. Come to find out, there are 87 <laughs> letters that Father Jergo and the uh, Bishop Martin and uh, uh, from Natchitoches and, and Bishop Jacquemet, uh, the Bishop of, uh, of Nantes at the time, had written back and forth that we did not know existed, which are now on that thumb drive in Shreveport. These letters, are, they're currently being translated, and uh, the, the first letter, come to find out, he arrives here and he says, I want to go home. <laughs> I mean, it's like a four-page letter, handwritten, yeah. something. Four-page letter, and it's uh, being translated. I mean, okay, so it wasn't like pure homesickness, but he's writing about uh, the, the race relations, the, the, the slavery of, uh, I mean, right now he's in Natchitoches. He's not yet in, in Monroe. Um, and, and when you see the church in which he was ordained, and, and think of, of, uh, of 
the, the fact that he knew he was leaving that behind, most likely never to go back, I mean, pretty extraordinary. So we have these letters, and as we, uh, as we keep, uh, and please, Lord, that they're all good, wonderful, positive, and, and how great to hear that he's scandalized by the slavery. You know, imagine if the first letter said, you know, and, and we're looking, I hate to say it like this, we're looking to get our own slave here, and, and, and we, we're buying into this whole system. I mean, how horrible that would have been, but... Good news is that our, our saintly priest was saintly from the beginning. Um, and I think it's actually a good thing that he wanted to go home, but that, that he said, no, nope, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay, and I'm about to be sent to Monroe, and we're going to learn all about, we're probably going to learn a lot about the city itself and what was going on before the war, during the war, after the war. And, you know, dear Bishop, uh, there's a new mayor in town. His name is this, and this is what he's proposing. You know, so I imagine that there will be a lot of civic-related uh, information that we'll be able to glean from these letters as well. So, all right, Eddie. So, one of you just mentioned something about the, the records. So, this is a little town, and now seven churches are under the administration of one priest. And since we were going to go straight north, the uh, it's a town called, it looks like Blaine, B-L-A-I-N, but they say Blaine. Blaine sounds better to me, but it's Blaine. Um, so we, I'm, I'm like, why not? Let's just go. It's a Saturday morning, let's go. Knock on the door, the priest, uh, an older uh, man himself, with jeans and kind of a, well, there he is. Uh, um, he says, oh, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, w w once he finally realized we were kind of legit. Uh, and he opens up this big armoire. I mean, that's what it, it was. And it has all of these old books. And he makes his way uh, to that, well, to another book. Finally, he gets to this book. And um, very long story short, because he took his time. Um, we find it. We find Father Louis Marie Jergot's um, um, baptism uh, record. Now, just before that, before we left, we went to the uh, their town hall, which was like everything: town hall, uh, tourist information, uh, post office, and, and it was all in a, a very tiny room. We walk in, and this woman's like, "Okay, you know, there's like six people walking in at once." And we explain what we are looking for. Uh, and she's like, oh, okay, one moment. She kind of walks around behind her desk, and there's like this plain uh, pane of, of, of glass. She goes there. We see her reach for 1833, the year of his birth. It, and we told him the actual birth date. She says, oh, here it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're just like, never it never <laughs> happens. It happened five times. At least five times. Well, five times with, with the baptism, uh, with the birth records, and uh, three or four times with the bat. I guess four times because we're still looking for one uh, baptism record and one ordination record. And the auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of Bren, who, when we met him, had only been ordained a bishop ten days. Hello, Monsignor Jolie. I hope you're watching too. Okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, he was very excited. In fact, he's already written back to me and asking for more information. He, he himself has a, an archivist-type spirit. He jumped into the archives there for the first time he, he had been there. I mean, he had just been ordained. He's like, I'm, I'm learning with you, too. And spent so much time, three and a half hours. Uh, Michael Dixon was keeping time. Um, three and a half hours that um, uh, he spent with us. And, uh, and we found his, um, uh, Father Camaray's, uh, I'm, I'm now starting to mix some stories, but uh, we found a different priest's uh, baptism record there. Anyhow, all right, so we, we find this. That priest was very kind. He's like, would you like coffee? We say no, that they make a pot of coffee. We say yes. We, we continue sitting there, and then we're like, we've got to go. We have, a, we have an appointment with the bishop, the new bishop of Rennes. Um, so th this is in Nantes. Um, this is the seminary where, where um, 
uh, uh, Jargo would have uh, been. And it, it's a long street this way, and on this side, it's been totally kind of re-stuccoed and um, painted. But then when we, when we walk down the street and turn and look back, this is the original. Uh, and, and we have an old postcard, actually, from the uh, uh, kind of the what, 1880s or something. Um, and we're like, oh, there it is. Um, anyways, uh, this is the, the Cathedral of Nantes. And I asked if I could come celebrate with them, and they said yes. Um, uh, I told you about the Archbishop, uh, excuse me, the Bishop uh, putting the thumb drive in, and there's Cheryl, that, you see me in the background taking the picture, <laughs> and Michael. Um, I mean, he was just super, uh, there's a group, Michael's mother, Chantal, a lot of you know her, uh, assisted with translation. Here's the rector of the cathedral, my counterpart here. And the guy all the way on the right is a, a seminary uh, professor. This is the young bishop, the 10-day-old bishop, who was uh, who just really immersed himself. If you notice, I have my cell phone there, giving him light to read documents from the uh, uh, 1800s. There, there's the poster, and this is the third bishop, Bishop Denis Moutel. Uh, I stayed in his residence for uh, three nights, super kind. Have any of you seen the movie uh, Of God and Men about the Algerian uh, Cistercian? Well, there were French priests uh, sent living in Algeria. Is it? So we got one person. I, I recommend it. I don't know if it's on Netflix or whatever. It is on Netflix. It is on Netflix. Of God and Men. I think God, it's of God's and Men. God, of God's and Men. So it's about these. French men who go there to Algeria, it's a time of unrest. Um, I mean, they're, most of them are ultimately martyred. Several of them are from this guy's diocese, and they were just declared blessed. So, I mean, uh, a couple of months ago. So, so all of this is, is in their, their minds as we're talking about these three priests from his diocese, and I'm showing him the stained glass windows, and again, they're like, are you kidding me? Well, why haven't we ever heard of these guys? And, and so, yeah. Claude Ribot, uh, Father Billet, he was the, the priest who was at um, uh, Fairfield, he was a chaplain to the sisters there, Mother Hyacinth, Mary Hyacinth, was from Brittany, you know, and so she was there, and Father Jean-Pierre, and she influenced, uh, they were the main influences on him coming over. Um, and he came over, not with the original three, but later, after the first Vatican Council, uh, Father Martin didn't come directly home. He went back to Brittany and then came home, and, and he got two more people to come with him, Father Guillet and Father Camaret. Uh, this is, they would have come over end of 1870, beginning of 1871, early, early 1871, uh, and two years later we know what happened. Um, so there's their church, uh, uh, I mean, and I, I did a video in there as well, and you can watch it some other time. Uh, the big press conference, I mean, these are journalists here, you can see a little bit of the camera over there. This is in the bishop's uh, kind of conference room. Now, now, you're looking at these six containers that, that fell. You should have been looking over here. A delegation of the diocese of Shreveport? If you notice, it's a delegation of the, to the diocese from the diocese of Shreveport, Louisiana. Uh, and so it's telling that this is in the newspaper of Nantes. If I'm correct, that's the second largest city in, in, in France, Paris, and then Nantes. I mean, I mean, again, everywhere we went, and, and they put all the names of the priests uh, right here that they died in the yellow fever of 1873. So there's the, the typical picture uh, explaining to them. Um, this was, um, this is what this is, this particular newspaper, 
story. So what happened was, uh, this is, and it's, it's also a, uh, and watch the news later tonight. It's one of those type, you know, kind of a teaser on some of the, uh, the, their web pages too. So we're presenting the stained glass windows in homage of the, uh, of the Breton priests. Um, and so from the, from the Diocese of Saint-Brieuc, they, they put the same thing on there. Here we're in an interview. Uh, here are the archives. And again, you see the, the, the French national television in the background. Um, were, you and then, aware, were you guys aware that the, that the press would be out and you could uh, No, absolutely not. <laughs> All that happened after you arrived. So we had been in communication with these three bishops, and the, the one whose vicar general was Francois Le Bezouet, uh, and three of the five priests come from his diocese. He was the one who was super interested. He is the one of his own initiative who got the three mayors of the three little towns to come for a luncheon in which we walk into this nice little dining room and the bishop is pouring champagne. You know, welcome everyone. And they have the French Bordeaux wine on the, on the table and, uh, and um, a multi-course meal. It's like we ate lamb for like... Four days in a row, uh, and drank apple cider. Uh, not with that meal, but um, so so. All right, um, good. Let me take your questions instead of me continuing to talk. Yes, Connie. Um, was anybody able to produce any pictures of So. Uh, did we find any pictures of these priests? The answer is no, as of yet. But at least I can say that we have these archivists very interested. And I don't think it's just because their bishops have made them interested. Maybe it was to begin with. But when they started finding things, uh, like the, the recent the, the picture of the archivist there, um, I mean, he gave like six, seven folders worth of, of, of information on these people. We haven't even yet translated them. We don't know completely what it is that we have. They continue to look, that auxiliary bishop, who was only like 10 days old as a bishop, um, continues to be interested. Um, he and I both studied in Rome, not together, but we made a quick connection and at times uh, dropped into Italian. Um, and so, so there's a good rapport. I've already told them, each one of them, I said, you know, in four years' time, we are going to uh, celebrate the 150th anniversary of the yellow fever in the city, and we're writing a book. And, um, I mean, I, I've showed you this before. Here's the 160 pages so far uh, of the book and my little uh, uh, suggestions with regards to um, my role in the book. And you know Ryan is sitting over there. He's the third person uh, with... Dr. White, um, is, is to really kind of add to the, the Catholic flavor uh, as much as possible to this, to this narrative of their lives. Um, so, uh, we're doing the comic strip. So, one of the things that we did, we made these folders that had the Cathedral of St. John Berkman's on the front. And it allowed me to show them, and I had pictures on my phone ready to show them as well, and the Cemetery of St. Joseph's. And the cemetery over there in Monroe. Um, um, but in that folder, we had some of the comic strips that you've already seen in the Catholic Connection. But we decided, hey, we have all the artwork. Take the English out, translate it, put it in French. Let's give it to them. And they see it. And again, it's another, uh, another way of getting the story out to the people. And I've offered it to them in a digital format. We should just send, uh, start sending them one at a time uh, via Dropbox or something. And then I, I want them to put it in their Catholic Connection or on their website. Get them interested in it. And one month at a time, they can slowly but surely tell the story. And when we get the whole thing together, make a French uh, version of it as, as well. So talk to us a little bit about the language. Um, do they understand English? So the language, uh, one of the main reasons that Chantal was present was uh, 
Um, she was able to be of assistance with uh, translating from English to French or French to English. Um, well, we did not know what the, the, the circumstance would be. What I did from the very beginning was I wrote letters, or, or Cheryl wrote them, and uh, we have someone here in the city who's completely, perfectly bilingual, and just very quickly and, and knows about the uh, Brittany and, and some of those special little phrases. And so, uh, put a lot of that, um, you know, gave me the translations. That's what I was corresponding with these bishops. I would get their response, I would copy and paste into Google uh, Translate, uh, and get a sense of what their, uh, especially the, the longer um, emails, and then, uh, and then at one point with the Bishop of Saint Brieuc, I said, "Hey, by the way, do you speak English?" <laughs> and he wrote back, uh, "Yes, I do. That will be no problem." And then, then he dropped back into French and said, "But it's easier for me to write in French, and so let me keep going." So, um, but the English actually. Uh, I thought was going to be an issue, and it, it wasn't. Um, I had been to France any number of times, especially when I was a, a student in Rome, and but, but I never had the personal connection. And so I, I always kind of found, especially in Paris, um, that it just wasn't easy being an American over there and trying to uh, get around. Quite the contrary in Brittany. Oh my goodness, they were great. And of course there was a personal connection, so that certainly made it a lot easier. And they did everything that they could to uh, have people assisting with English. Like the, the father, Vicar General, Francois Le Bezouet, uh, he his English was very poor. And, uh, but each of the bishops, they, they did very well, especially uh, Bishop uh, Mutel. I love how they are fascinated about the story, and, and they should be, and they want to continue learning more. Um, so, as I think you know, every single country has a, almost every single country has an ambassador from the Vatican to the United States. Like, uh, President Trump has an ambassador to the Holy See. Uh, uh, well, Pope Francis has an ambassador, we call him a nuncio, to the United States. Do you know what country this nuncio is from? Brittany. France. You know what part of France? Brittany. Dad, you can't say, I already told you. <laughs> Brittany, yes. Um, he was ordained in the same cathedral that our very first bishop here in the Diocese of Natchitoches was from. So I've already told him face to face. I spoke with him about all of this. He's like, what are you talking about? And I said, yeah, this is for real. Started showing him pictures on my phone. He said, send those to me. And I sent it to him. I have his personal email address. Um, and so um, you're not surprised to hear that I gave him an update with regards to what we found in these, uh, in these places. Yes. Yes. Okay, um, we, Mother Hyacinth lived a good long life. So she, she came here to Louisiana, was the, the mother superior of the Fairfield uh, convent, and then um, ultimately made her way back to Brittany, uh, to, the, to the convent there, and uh, was buried in the convent uh, 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 cemetery, uh, of Treguet. So if you go to Saint Brieuc and you keep going up a little further northwest, um, you find um, that di it used to be a diocese, now they're combined, uh, Saint Brieuc hyphen Treguet. Um, so we were there, sat at a, a table, uh, waited for about 30 minutes for the priest who was late. Uh, Michael Dixon entertained us with uh, card tricks. Um, <laughs> Our driver was just on, he was just beside himself watching it. Um, yeah, I digress. Um, and um, finally when he arrives, come to find out the pastor of the, of the unbelievably beautiful cathedral, my goodness, which was built over 
centuries, and you can see it in the architecture, um, shows up and he's a relative of Mary Hyacinth, who calls up uh, one of his relatives uh, who had done some uh, writing uh, all about her. So we have yet another avenue in which to explore because she wrote about these priests, um, especially uh, at the time of and right after the epidemic, after their deaths. And so we still have some of those letters. We'd love to get more of those letters, but hopefully we'll, we'll find out even more about her as well. Tina. Right. I mean, the, the, they are, they have bent over backwards. The archivists there have been super kind. The bishops are uh, intrigued. Uh, the, the press, Americans, the American delegation has come to France. I mean, for them, uh, that, that's just, you know, it just really, I mean, it, it just kind of boggles their mind. And they're, they're super intrigued that we're the ones going to them telling them about their people and what they did for us here in our country. And so, yeah, uh, again, what we found, we found almost everything that we wanted to find. We didn't find everything. Uh, but then we were given so much stuff that we didn't even know existed. And the, the goal is, uh, yes, we're going to write this book. Um, we're also going to write biographies to the best of our ability with regards to these five priests. We are going to, um, you know, we have the comic strip. Um, we're going to, I mean, I, I can see uh, some type of a Hollywood production. <laughs> Maybe not Hollywood, but some type of an independent film. I mean, it's, it's an interesting story. Martin These guys Scorsese. make their... Get Martin Scorsese. Martin Scorsese, you know. You know. Well, that's right, he did silence, didn't he? Um, so, um, yes. It's all about the history of these five priests. It's not about telling people about the yellow fever. There are tons of books about the yellow fever. But in the book, it will obviously highlight this particular epidemic. It was the third worst in the United States. It took out a quarter of the population of Shreveport. Uh, it was a particularly a virulent, uh, is that the right, can I say virulent with the uh, yellow fever? Um, and I mean, the symptoms that these priests witnessed and then themselves endured. Um, so, right, this is, this is going to be more of a, like, the lives of the saints type book, but it's more in a narrative format. We will have biographies. That's a, that's a different work. The ultimate goal, as we've stated before, is keeping in mind exactly what Pope Francis wrote a couple of years ago about this new path to holiness, as in being canonized saints, it has been opened up. You know, to be a martyr, you're killed for the faith. Now, you know, specifically, you are Catholic, and because of what you're doing, therefore I'm going to kill you. But, um, but to have someone enter into an area in which they know that they're going to die, their life is about to be shortened, they're running into a, a battle. Um, um, uh, there's gunfire, but the priest runs in, and we have several priests, by the way, one from Louisiana who did this and was killed uh, because of his serving um, um, his, his brothers who were being injured. Um, so so it, it, a, a martyr to their charity. The, this is a phrase that is on the tombstone of Father Jargo in, in Monroe. And if you ever go there, just you put it in Google Maps, St. Matthew's Cemetery. It's not adjacent to St. Matthew's Church. Mm -hmm about a mile away, just put it in, into the Google Maps, you'll find it, go to the main road, right down the main road, there's a, there's a cross, and you'll see the beautiful tomb of Father Jago. And by the way, at one point, I did Google Earth uh, at St. Joseph's Cemetery, 
and I took a picture of Google Earth. That's the way I did it. I know. Anyways, um, and I showed it to them. I said, "Look, your your great 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 uncle, your or whoever. Here's Google. Here's the whole cemetery. Here it is now." Because now you're looking at it like this. Imagine a mound, a big, huge scene of Calvary, um, the crucifixion. You have Mary, you have St. John, and, and you see these tombs. Now, of course, you're looking at it overhead, so you see these big, huge ledgers right there. I said, yeah, you, you, your loved one is buried right here. You know, in, in the place of honor. Um, and here's Father Pierre, and here's Father Camaray. So Father Belay, remember, he was buried with the sisters uh, in the, the sisters' cemetery, which is located where Sears is now, the, the Mall St. Vincent's. Uh, when they were exhumed, uh, uh, they were um, transferred to Forest Park. So when you go to Forest Park, don't go to the main side, go to the Catholic side that was uh, part of Monsignor Rouleau's, um property. And even all oh, that's a fascinating story. He died 111 years ago, almost to the day. Um, 101 years ago, almost to the day. Uh, that piece of property was given by a monsignor of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church and is now the Catholic side. Now, when you go there and you take a left into that side, you see kind of the mausoleum that's right there. Park right in front of the mausoleum. Go, first of all, before you go into the front door, is just go a little bit on the right and you'll see a plaque with all the names of the sisters uh, who were there uh, before 1940. So, I mean, it's a, it's a big, long list. Go inside all the way to the back, right, all the way on the bottom is where Father Belay is buried. And then you'll look up there and you'll see the names of all these sisters who are buried there. And not all, in fact, the majority of them after 1940, but anyhow, that accounts for the five priests. We are hoping to do another video Shocker, right? Uh, in front of the five windows and talked specifically to our uh, bishop friends over there and some of the people and let them know and, and give them an even closer up look of, of each of the panels. And we want to go also to the cemetery um, to have Cheryl, Ryan, myself uh, uh, giving the story. And here we are in the cemetery. Go to Father Belay's tomb in the mausoleum. Go to Monroe, and here we are standing at the, the tomb of Father Jargo. Um, so, any final comments? Yeah, can I add something? Kind of fun? Um, because, you know, Father has talked about the fact that the reason for all of this, obviously, is our intention, our hope to bring this, the attention of this to Rome, um, to open up a cause on their behalf. And so, Father Peter knows that I've reached out, but he doesn't know that I've made contact with a priest in England who right now has worked on a, uh, a project. Any of you ever heard of a man named Father Thomas Biles? He went down on the deck of the Titanic. And he has just been declared a servant of God. And so there's one single priest in the world who has worked diligently to bring all of this to the attention of Rome. And I think we'll have a lot to learn from him. He's willing to help. So uh, this is something that can be done. And, and that obviously is the ultimate goal of all of this, is, to, is to, to, to do this and have them one day be canonized. I don't know that any of us would live to see it. Michael Dixon might, maybe. But I don't know that any of us would. So anyway. But, but imagine, even if they are declared servants of God. Right. The, the very first step of the process, and as far as we can tell, um, these guys have what it takes to be declared servants of God. And then you become venerable. And then if there's a miracle uh, uh, directly attributed to you, you can be blessed if there's a second one uh, uh, canonized. And I mean, I don't know. I mean, hopefully they... Yeah. So, have you ever heard of um, Paul Meeky and Companions? Right. Have you ever heard of um, uh, uh, Isaac Jogues and Companions? Mm -hmm. Well, th that might end up being what this is going to be. You know, Father Jergo and Companions. 
uh, or Father Levesowit and Companions. Uh, one day, I mean, it'll be my luck. I'll be part of and Companions. Uh, anyways, no. hey, wouldn't that be great? But, yeah. uh, anyhow, um, we uh, th th these people did exactly what Pope Francis said uh, is enough to be um, considered models of, of heroic virtue uh, in as much as they proclaimed their faith, they were thoroughly Catholic. In the face of persecution, they, they, they remained, they, they uh, and, and then when it came time for an epidemic, what did they do? They stayed. You know, we have, we have the lives and the stories of a lot of the Protestant and Jewish leaders at the time who were, who said, uh, and suggested to everyone to leave. Um, they stayed. And they saw that. I mean, and, and that's why, you know, what we call it Pierre Avenue. It's, it's Pierre. It's that, that road is named for Father Jean Pierre. That, I mean, there's a major thoroughfare, it used to be even more major once upon a time, uh, named for our priest. Um, anyhow. Any, anything else? Can't live another day without knowing about these priests. We're going to get all the information to you. You know it. You know it very well. In the meantime, we're going to uh, continue our uh, great contact with the people over there. If any of those bishops wish to come, I should maybe address them. If any of our bishop friends wish to come at any time beforehand, obviously we're going to uh, uh, host them and, and pull out the red carpet. One of the other things that we are doing right now, and some of you might find this of interest, especially if you have any loved ones buried in St. Joseph's Cemetery, is that we're currently uh, working on a plan to com uh, completely renovate that whole Calvary area where the priests are buried. The, the whole scene can easily be refurbished and you know the original bronze brought back and the, the plaque that's on there can be redone. The steps that lead up to it are kind of collapsing outward you know, to have them redone, and the ledgers that are on top of each of these priests' um, um, remains, um, have them uh, redone as well. We're looking at uh, granite being placed, looking at granite being placed on, on top of it, and uh, more like the uh, cemetery ledger that, that you find on top of uh, Louis Jargot in, in Munro. That one is really beautiful, very, very nice. Ours is beautiful in its simplicity, but you know we want to bump it up a little bit more, maybe even leave a little room for Servant of God uh, on there as well. Thank you for your attention. I need to get ready uh, to go next door, and uh, please come back next week. Thank you. Thank you, guys.